Good evening, Grace Point. It is another Wednesday evening from the back porch, and uh, just wanted to um, to share with you something I believe the Lord's laid on my heart, and we're going to be looking at an incredibly familiar passage of Scripture. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, chances are you haven't been to more than one funeral and not heard this passage, so um, you may already know now what, what we're talking about, but if you don't, let me go ahead and, uh, and let you know it's the book of Psalms, Psalm 23. And in Psalm 23, what we're going to do tonight is, is look at this in, in something that I've entitled an analysis, an analysis of Psalm 23. Um, and my prayer is that it will, we'll glean something different from it, um, perhaps than we've seen before, or maybe uh, get a little better understanding, maybe of some, some of the intricacies of, if you will, of this psalm, it is incredible. It's uh, it's incredible in its scope. It's incredible in what it covers. It's incredible in its promises. So my prayer is that we'll do that. All right. Uh, just want to remind you, Grace Point, that uh, this coming Sunday we will regather in the in the worship center, um, and for our regular worship time. In addition to that, you'll be able to view the, the message online if you're not comfortable in coming, or if you're comfortable in coming but not coming into the building, we'll have it available through the FM transmit an FM transmitter, so you'll be able to um, to listen to it on your radio there with others who have gathered in the parking lot. So several opportunities for you, but uh, but again, we we invite you to come and 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 be a part. Um, God's people need to fellowship. And so even if it's at a distance, we can still fellowship together. So my prayer is that we'll see many of you um, come, and, and, uh, but then if you don't feel comfortable with that, don't feel guilty about that either, because we're making arrangements for you as well. Amen? All right, Psalm 23. Let me go ahead and read it together. You, you probably can quote it from memory, but let's look at it anyway. Psalm 23. It's a psalm of David, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is an incredible uh, psalm. It's an incredible passage. I think sometimes we, we do it a disservice just kind of gleaning over it and reading it and, and relegating it to a just, just one specific, specific purpose. Uh, and I believe it is a psalm of great encouragement for all of us and, a great, and of great teaching as well. And, and it exposes, it, it, it uncovers, it reveals to me some of the incredible truths of God. And uh, particularly when it comes to His... His love for us and, and the attributes of His love. So let's, let's look at it in analysis. We'll be looking at it line for line. So there at the beginning, it says, the psalmist says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And what does shepherd signify? Well, I believe that reveals relationship. That's the relationship. You know, one of the blessings that we have as, as believers in Christ is the understanding that through Jesus Christ, we have an intimate personal relationship with God the Father. Um, John 10 verses 27 through 28 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. You see, if you know the Lord Jesus, who is the Good Shepherd, you know His voice. And if you heard His call and responded to the wooing of the Holy Spirit and trusted Him as your Lord and Savior and, and became a, a member of grafted into the family of God, you are, a, you are a, a believer in Jesus Christ, you are born again, then you have a, an everlasting relationship with the Good Shepherd, the relationship with God the Father. 
So when the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, it's a very intimate relationship. The shepherd cared for the sheep. Jesus used this analogy many times. Remember when he said that, that if, if uh, what shepherd has a has, uh, hundred sheep and, and one should stray away, uh, does not leave the 99 to go and find the one. There's a very personal, intimate relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. He knows them, and the sheep know his voice. I, I was reading one time that it has to do with a lot of times the shepherd of the flocks would be pinned together for certain circumstances with other flocks. And the shepherd could actually go up and call his sheep, and those sheep who were his belonged to his flock would actually hear him and follow while the others wouldn't. So there's a very intimate aspect of, of the Lord being our shepherd. So that's relationship. This is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That speaks to me of supply. Supply or, or, or uh, provision, if you will, or uh, sustenance. It, is, it comes from the Lord. James 1.4 says, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete. Now, I love these three words. Lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. The scripture says in another place, it says that I have, I have not seen uh, one of God's people go without bread. I mean, think about that. The Lord cares. If He cares for the sparrows, in the air, or the wheat, the flowers in the field, how much more does He care for you? God is our everlasting supply. You know, I think oftentimes we look to everything else first, and then we turn to the Lord when all else is exhausted, when there is need in our life. Friend, I, I want you to understand, we need to go to Him first and foremost. He is our supply. He is the one who provides. He is our shepherd who cares for us, and He gives us that which we need. The Lord is my shepherd, the psalmist says, I shall not want that supply. But then he says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Um, that's rest. You know, there's rest in the Lord. Um, there, there's mercy, there's grace, there's forgiveness, there's comfort, there's peace, there's hope, there's rest in the Lord. And, and you know, it, it's a, it's a, He is a solace from the crazy times of, of this world. He's a, He's a respite in the midst of a storm. He is a, He is a, He's calm waters in a raging sea. He is a, a break from the battering winds of life. He is our rest. Jesus worded this perfectly in one of my favorite verses, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, where he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And then Jesus says very succinctly, And I will give you rest. You see, the psalmist knew in spite of the troubles he had, in spite of, uh, of what he faced in his life, he knew that rest was in the Lord. He didn't need to go to anywhere else. He didn't need to go to any other's arms. He learned that in the hard way, right? He could just simply go to the Lord and rest in Him. And for you and me, that is equally true. He is our rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friend, we need to remember that. And don't take that for granted. Let's go to Him when we have need. Let's go to Him when the trials of life seem to be overwhelming, when the stresses of life are threatening to overtake us. We can always count on the Lord. He is your rest. So the Lord is my shepherd. That's relationship. I shall not want. That's supply. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, that's rest. And then He leads me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. The still waters. In, a, in an area, in a land where water was scarce sometimes and where water was very precious, it was, uh, it was equally precious to have a calm, flowing stream where one could go down and, and, and use the water effectively as opposed to a rushing, raging river where one could, could get the refreshment that they needed, the cooling of the water, the, the, the water that was needed for sustenance of life, and all of those things. 
he leads me beside not just waters, but the still waters. The word translates there to calm waters. He leads me beside the calm waters. Listen, this world is a raging river sometimes. But our God can lead us by the calm rivers of the water that, that nev the well that never runs dry, right? And that's the bounty of the Lord Himself. He leads me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 20 says, Repent therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Friend, listen, does it seem like things are out of control in your life? I know oftentimes they are out of control in my life, and oftentimes it's of my own making. But you know what? The Lord is my shepherd, and He does lead me beside still waters when I come to Him. You need refreshing today? Don't look anywhere else. Turn to the one who can give it. And His name is Jesus. Turn to the Lord for he is your, res your rescue. He is your refreshment. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And He restores my soul. That's, that's healing. Uh, 1 Peter 2.24 says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. I mean, think about that. James 5.15, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Wow, there's, there's healing in forgiveness. Amen? Sometimes the healing of forgiveness that heals the soul and heals the heart and heals the mind is, is even of more value than that healing which heals the body. I mean, you can come to Him. He restores my soul. No matter how far you and I have strayed, no matter how, how far away from the intimate presence of the Lord we feel, all we have to do is turn to Him. And He will, by His own promise and His own word, He will forgive and He will restore us to that place of righteousness with Him. Why? Because He clothes us in His own righteousness. Wow. The Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul. Well then, next line is, He leads me in the paths of righteousness. That's guidance. You know, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if left to our own devices, we're, we're going to take the wrong route just to, almost as often as we take the right one. Do you know it? I mean... I mean, left to our own devices, we'll make mistakes. How many times has the Lord guided you in a particular direction when you were about to make a mistake in another direction? Or how many times have you ignored the, the guidance of the Lord and gone your own way and then only to have to have Him rescue you and bring you back to a place of restoration? Friend, listen, He is our guidance. He is our guide. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct or make straight your paths. Think about that. He will make straight your paths. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. You know, there's far less chance of pain and trouble coming my way if I will, lead, if I will follow the guidance of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. But then the next line we see, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Now what does this represent in our lives? Well, here's what it represents for you and for me. I believe it represents purpose. That's purpose. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You, you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Do you get that? God has set you and me apart for a purpose and for a reason. And what is it? It's so that we might proclaim his excellence, proclaim his glory, Proclaim His light into the darkness. 
Think about that. We have been called to glorify Him. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, we have been given a purpose. We are called by His name. And being called by His name, we are here to represent Him to a lost and dying world. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to glorify Him. You see, He is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He gives me purpose. Well then, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We use this as a great comfort to us when a loved one has passed away because we say they did not experience death, really. They just moved from this life to the next life. And that's true. Death has lost its sting. Jesus procured that on Calvary's cross. And when He raised, He was resurrected from the grave. Think about that. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. So He rescued us from that. But what does it mean here in this in this context, I believe it can be referred to testing in our lives. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's a scary time. It's a time of, uh, of, of discomfort. It's a time of testing. James 1.3 says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or patience. Right? Think it not strange when you face the fiery trials. For the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. First Peter one seven. So that the tested genuineness of so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold than perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen. There will be trials in this world. There will be testing. James made it very clear. Don't think it's odd when you face trials and tests in this life. But know this. He is the one who walks through us. And the sting of death cannot touch us. Even though we walk through that valley, He is still with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's testing in our life. But then, then the psalmist says, I will fear no evil. I love this one. What does it tell us? Well, if, if the testing of the, if there's walking through the shadow of death is testing, then I will fear no evil. Even in that circumstance, that obviously has to be my and your protection. You see, this, this shows us the protection of the Lord. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. You can trust Him. Listen, the Lord will protect. One of the greatest... Uh, reasons for the shepherd was to protect the flock from the predators. The sheep have no natural defenses, and they were literally sitting ducks to, to the predators of the day. But the shepherd with his staff, he would care for, he would tend, and he would protect the sheep. And friend, I want you to know that God is your protector. And He's my protector. Are we in His family? Do we belong to Him? Then He will care for us. And there is no need to fear evil. Why? Because evil has been defeated ultimately. Again, on the cross of Calvary, the blood of Christ has defeated the evil in this world. And He is our protection. And we can rely on and turn to Him. The Lord is my shepherd. I will fear no evil. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Next, for you are with me. For you are with me. In other words, we need to understand that there is nowhere in this world that we go that is apart 
from the care and protection and presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it boggles my mind to consider, even when I am doing that which I should not do, Jesus is still there and He does not leave. Oh, if I would just but have a broken heart to a greater extent when I know that my, that my life and my behavior, my thoughts, my words do not bring honor and glory to Him because He is always there with me. But because of that, we can trust, trust that He's with us, and that's faithfulness. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's always with me, and He never leaves, and He never changes. He is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, even when we are faithless, that's what that word if means. It means since, or even when we are faithless. He remains faithful, for He cannot deny himself. You see, he has promised that he wouldn't leave us. He's there with us. You can count on it and you can trust him in it. He is faithful. The psalmist says, you, O oh God, are with me. And then he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And in what context? Again, it's protection, but I also think of the rod. And, and scripture says, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. So, so the rod brings an idea of discipline. So your rod and your staff, they come for me. That's discipline in your life and in mine. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 says, And have you forgotten the ex exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. You see, the discipline of the Lord is something to be welcomed. You and I need to understand that when God disciplines us, it's not because he's a, he's a big ogre in the sky waiting to slap us when we do wrong. He is a loving Father who is disciplining us so that we might learn, so that we might be protected from even ourselves and from that which threatens our, around us. That's discipline. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What do we see there? I believe what that clearly shows is hope. Hope in the Lord. I mean, isn't it, isn't it something to think about? The table there is a picture of abundance. It's a picture of a banquet. So even in the presence of the enemy, God's going to provide all we need, even up to a banquet, a bountiful blessing. I mean, think about that. I mean, if you, know, if you would consider being in the presence of the enemy, uh, you would think you'd be hiding or cowering. No. The Lord has put a table before us. There is hope in Him. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You may abound in hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, for, the, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. You see, the Lord will prepare a table before you, even in the presence of your enemies. Don't fear them. Don't fear the evil. Just trust that the Lord will make a way. There's hope. And that's not a, 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 a scary possibility. No, or a fleeting possibility. That hope is a settled certainty. He is your hope. He's your only hope. If you don't know him today, I want you to know you'll not find peace anywhere else. You'll not find hope anywhere else. You'll not find love to, a, to the real extent anywhere else. It's only in Christ. So turn your life to him today. So you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Then the psalmist says, you anoint my head with oil. That's consecration. What does that mean, consecration? Well, listen to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith 
in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the Lord Jesus shed his blood so that he might consecrate you and me. Uh, just like in the story of the, of the prodigal son, the loving father, who, who is a, a definite picture of God himself. When the son returned home, what did he do? He put the robe of righteousness on him. And listen, you and I have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ if we are children of the king. That's consecration. You anoint my head with oil. You know what it means? God has put His Holy Spirit in my life. He's covered me with His oil. I am selected. I am separated. I am secured. And I am called out for a purpose in Him. I have been anointed with the oil of, of, of heaven itself. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Listen, you want to know what it feels like to have the anointing of God in your life? Then simply surrender to Him and listen intently and get to know in intimate, personal affection the person of His Holy Spirit who lives within you. Man, you've been anointed as a child of God. Well, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. That's hope. You anoint my head with oil. That's consecration. And then my cup runs over. Well, that's definitely a picture of abundance, right? The cup runs over. Uh, John 10.10, 10, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Listen, there is joy in Jesus. There is abundant hope in Christ. There is everything we need. The grace of God is never exhausted. It is a well that never runs dry. It's a cup that runs over and over and over continuously. Philippians 4.19 And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Wow, my cup runs over. The psalmist says, even in the midst of trial, in the presence of enemies, and, and when things are tough, I know that Jesus, God, the Father, the triune Godhead, will pour out in abundance on me and on you. Our cup, it does run over. Well, then next line is, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Well, that's blessing. That's just the blessing of God. Mercy and goodness will follow me all the days of my life. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Romans 15, 29, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Listen, it's, it's, it's enough of a blessing to know that when Jesus returns and, and the rapture happens, we'll go up to glory to be with Him forever and ever. That's enough blessing. But oh, beyond that, He comes that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Oh, and the abundance is, is, a, is a continual flow from heaven itself as it's poured out over and over and over again. And, and, and guess what? God blesses us I believe God wants to bless us way more than we're ever even prepared to allow Him to bless us. If we would put ourselves in the position of the blessing of God, waiting expectantly for His blessing, I believe He longs to bless you as His child. We need to surrender to Him and follow Him and, 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 and allow Him to guide us. And I believe the blessing of God is abundant even today. So surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. What is that? Well, that's security. That's the, the, the protection of the house of God. Psalm 122.7 says, Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Did you know that as a child of God, you are, you are sealed in the hand of God, yeah, in, in His hand. 
And, and, and Jesus says, nothing can separate you from the love of God that seals you in the hand of God. Nothing can take you out. Why? Because you've been bought with a price. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And in being purchased by the blood of Jesus, you are filled with His Spirit. You are consecrated in Him. Wow. You are wrapped in the love of Christ. You are enveloped in Him. I am in Christ and He is in me. And then in addition to that, you are sealed by the Spirit of God and you are wrapped in the hand of God the Father. Can you imagine? There is nothing that can touch you outside of the hand of God and His permission. I don't know about you, but, but boy, that's, that's some security to me. Romans 8, 8, 38 and 39, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, if that is not an all-inclusive list, that there is nothing can separate you from God's love, even yourself as a created being, you cannot separate yourself from the love of God. God loves you, and it's based on Him and His grace. You can trust Him. Wow, dwell in the house of the Lord. There's security in God's house. Amen. There's security in His family. And then finally it says, and you know it, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Well, quite clearly, that's eternity. And what better place to go than John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life forever and ever. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And that is life everlasting. You know, I don't have to worry. My forever is wrapped up in Jesus, and it's secure. I mean, think about it. Face it. The 23rd Psalm is one giant of a passage. There's so much that can be gleaned from this. But on this very surface scaling or analyzing of it, look at all the things that we can see about the nature of your loving God and mine. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The psalmist tells us that in God, in Christ, we have a relationship. We have our supply, our rest, refreshment. There's healing. There's guidance. There's purpose. There's testing. There's protection. There's faithfulness. There's discipline, there's hope, there's consecration, there's abundance, there's blessing, and there's security, and all eternity is ours. Let's face it, the Lord loves you. And you know what the most valuable thing in your life and my life is? It's not what we have in our lives. No, very simply, it's who we have in our lives. The Lord is my shepherd. I pray he's yours as well. God bless you.